Welcome to another installment of Jam More Interviews. I am your host. Let me get the chain right. <laughs> I am your host, Josh, aka Jam More. And today, I have an extremely important guest for you guys today on this musical Monday, <laughs> new term. <laughs> My guest today is a multi Grammy award winning artist and a prolific producer. He has produced for acts such as Korn, Hole, Soundgarden, Aerosmith, Ozzy Osbourne, Marilyn Manson, The Bronx, Soul Asylum, Violet Femmes, The Red Hot Chili Peppers, and tons more. Multiple records he's produced and worked on have gone on to go platinum, including two of my favorites, Korn's Untouchables and Soundgarden Super Unknown. On top of being one kick-ass producer, he is a highly accomplished musician, being one of the original members of the band Material with producer and bassist Bill Laswell. This enabled him to co-write and co-produce Herbie Hancock's smash hit single, Rocket, which has had a lasting effect in hip hop history. He's worked with people such as Pharrell, Andre 3000, Janet Jackson, Whitney Houston, and y'all, if I kept going, we would be here for hours. Please help me give a warm welcome to multi-talented artist, iconic producer, author, composer, father, and fellow Queens, New York native, Michael Byhorn. What the, yo, my brain just like farted on me. There you are. Here I am. Oh my gosh, man. Thank you so much. How you doing? I'm well, thanks. How are you? I'm doing um I'm doing fabulous. Um before I get into to, to, to the questions and all that, I would just like to say how much of a huge honor and a humbling experience it is for me as someone who is so much of a music lover and who doesn't get to speak to musicians as much as I would love to. It's such an honor to speak to someone so prolific and profound as yourself, you know. I've always been intrigued by the behind the scenes and talking to producers and people who've made music, you know. My father, God rest his soul, was so into producing and making his own beats. I remember I would walk into his room and the music he was making would like shake the walls in the house mm. because he was just so into it and he just loved music producing so much. So this is a huge honor. Thank you so much for giving me some of your time and I hope to make an amazing experience for you today. Oh, well, thank you. Absolutely. Well, I guess my first question to kick this all off is, you know, how does it feel to be able to look back on your life and where you are now and just look at all the amazing accomplishments you've done, you know, winning a Grammy, making Herbie Hancock's uh, Rocket, helping make that, or, or, you know, being able to write a book or producing for so many of these acts. What is that feeling like? <laughs> That's kind of a trick question. I mean, it, it feels exactly how you would imagine it would feel. <laughs> it's it's lovely. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with it. I recommend it to anyone who you know who wants to go down the road and find out for themselves. It's a good thing. Absolutely. It, it truly is like like I said I, I, the intro was such a struggle for me because it's like if I say one thing I'm leaving out another because you've just like done so much and have been in this industry for such a long time it's it's it must be an amazing amazing thing to be like wow like I did that or like recently reaching 20 and uh, 20 years on Corden's Untouchable a couple of weeks ago you know that that must be an exhilarating feeling to be like damn I did that 20 years ago with those guys well I I think what was really what was much more exhilarating. I mean, apart from the fact that I, I love that record and that's a, it was a real seminal experience doing it. Like, the, I I'd forgotten actually that this was twenty years, but I was reminded because someone posted on a social media account that the record saved their life. You know, and I was like, I mean, I knew that it had a really strong effect on people, but I didn't realize just how strong. And I started seeing other people who were posting things about how they'd been in, you know, they'd been depressed, suicidal, and how the record really kind of helped pull them out of it. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I had, I, I didn't have any idea what it had actually meant to people. And, you know, one of the cool things about that record is, you know, that, that I actually helped write lyrics on, on a lot of the songs. So... Uh, it's, you know, that, that involvement, I mean, apart from like helping cr like craft the whole the sonic character of the record, 
being involved as a as a co-composer on it it you know i mean again i i can't really put it into words but you can imagine <laughs> i definitely could man jesus yeah. what was it what was it like when you got your first grammy um well i got nominated um in one category and uh the song and herbie was nominated in another category this was for rocket and i lost in the category that i was nominated in um i lost to <laughs> coincidentally well, i mean it was funny to me at the time and it still is in a way that we we lost to um the, the love theme to flash dance <laughs> by giorgio moroder um you know and you know I, it it was actually one of the awards that was get, that was uh that was uh given like pre prior to the 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 show being televised so i was sitting there in the, in the audience watching people go on stage you know and everyone's in the audience like like that it was you know it was basically for people who are in the industry you know like best you know best sound on a on like a, a bluegrass record and stuff like that You know, it's all like the engineers, like all the people, all the blue-haired people who actually pay to be in the academy didn't show up until <laughs> until the cameras were on. So everyone's just sitting around, uh, you know, my award comes on, I lost. I'm kind of like, mm, you know. But then when Herbie come when when the, <laughs> when the when the when the ceremony actually happened, you know, Herbie was performing at the at at the award show, which is a pretty good indication that you're going to win. I mean, you're not you don't you don't have an artist who's nominated for an award come up and then oh, he lost. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So it was actually really funny because he played, it was amazing. People went crazy. He won. He gets up on stage and he like thanks everyone in the entire world except me. And the guy I was working with who created and who basically created the song for him and and I was kind of like, what? <laughs> what and I had people calling me up for weeks afterwards going like do you believe that he did that and I was like frankly no I, I don't <laughs> yeah you know so it was kind of a it, it was sort of like a mixed bag you know but It was it was that that was a pretty amazing ride nonetheless. You know, it was uh it was it was funny. That was my first time going to like an an award show like that. So I was like 23 24. No, I was 23. It was in February. Uh so <laughs> Yeah, it was pretty it was pretty wild. Wow. I could I couldn't imagine, you know, watching them now be televised and just They're seeing how big it is and how many artists are in the room and, and people going on stage to perform and all that energy in the room is just, wow. It must have been exhilarating to, to sit there with everyone. It was exhilarating the very first time going to that, you know, just kind of being like a, a little kid, basically, like, <laughs> you know, in the Shrine Auditorium and you're like, what, what, you know, but... I've I've only been to one other award ceremony and I have to be honest man I started to kind of like not act a little bit <laughs> After a while I was like I'm supposed to be excited why can't I keep my eyes open <laughs> you know it was real it was really funny <laughs> <laughs> It kind of goes back to the thing where I've heard in multiple interviews when you're like, when you're listening to music, you, sometimes when something's not right, you'll like nod out or like pay attention to something else when you're uh, listening to the record. Well, the thing is, is that when you're watching the Grammy Awards, you know, from the, pr the privacy of your own home and they have, you know, they, they, they're editing and like, you know, cutting to this camera, cutting to that camera. It's a lot different than sitting in the audience going like, Just bopping your head. <laughs> you know, and then, you know, there's like the commercial breaks and you basically, you, you're sitting there and, you know, there's, there's an announcement that you better go to the bed. You better be back in your seat like quickly before like the, before the commercial break is over. 
Otherwise, they're going to stick someone else in your seat because they have to show that the place is packed the whole time. So they don't. Yeah, like so. If you like, if you miss your bathroom break, or if you, or, or if you're stuck in the bathroom <laughs> and you're taking too long to wipe, you know they've got people on hand to kind of like take your seat, and you just got to stand there and wait for like the next break. You know. I didn't know that. Yeah. That makes so much sense, though. <laughs> it makes so yeah. much sense, though. And then when there's a commercial break, everyone who's on stage is like, <sighs> you know, like, oh boy, you know, they make a couple of snarky comments to the audience, like, so when's this going to be over? You know, something like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's it's not the it's not the way it seems. You know, it's kind of it's it's a lot of it's for show. You know, I mean, it's. I, I'm not trying to let. I, I don't want to downplay it too much because it can be exciting. But you know, th the last time I went, I was like, it's a good thing I don't get nominated that much. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I mean, because honestly, that's the only reason I would go to one of those things. You know, it's just it's kind of like, eh. <laughs> you know, it's more fun to work. I like working more. And we, I could definitely tell, which makes me want to give more into to your background and how you really got started in this. And I'm intrigued, you know, we're both Queens, New York boys, you know, we both came. came what part of Queens are you from? Jamaica. Oh, man, I was from, I'm from Forest Hills, right nearby. <laughs> See, you know, yeah, but, you know, obviously, right? my New York is very different from New your New York. So I'm intrigued. How would you say yeah. your childhood? Uh, hmm? I was just laughing, as in yes, quite a bit, I would imagine. Yeah, and we'll get talk about that more as well. But how has your childhood environment helped influence you as not only an artist but as a person as well? Um, I, I mean, my environment outside my house had absolutely nothing to do with it at all. You know, my folks were both into music and the arts, and that kind of swayed me in that direction. Um, you know, I mean, I wasn't interested in anything that was going on in my neighborhood. <laughs> you know, I was just interested in, in the stuff that I liked, and that made me... That made me more insular, but, you know, I, I was able to, like, to concentrate on stuff in ways that other kids couldn't. You know, so it made me, it actually made me very good at being able to listen to things and to, you know, hear stuff that was going on, things that might need fixing or to imagine a way to make a record sound. Like, obviously, all that happened later in life. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, also, like, I was raised in a really strange time. It's actually kind of a little bit similar to what's happening right now. Just because everything's so crazy now. Although I have to say it's a lot crazier now than it was back in the 60s. But, That's you know, so I mean, the country, the country was falling apart then, you know. But it wasn't going to splinter. I mean, it, was, it, it wasn't going to crash like it looks like the country is now. <laughs> um, you know. Yeah, it's a whole other topic. Um, <laughs> but uh, that, I guess how tumultuous all that was and how crazy it was, that kind of, that had an influence on me as well. Uh, because there was like, there was always a sense for me of trying to find order in chaos, uh, no matter how extreme the chaos was. Uh, so, yeah. So, I mean, that, but that aspect of it played a tremendous a, a tremendous role in in what I do. I definitely relate to that. You know, obviously, like I say, ours is different. You know, I heard in interviews you talk about some, you'd be lucky if you went to a certain part of the neighborhood and came out alive. Like, I'm like, what the what? <laughs> That's crazy. Because for me, it's just kind of like, I'd walk to the corner store and back and come to my house and just relax and put on a cartoon or watch like Transformers animated or something like that. Or, you know, that's how I got into acting, just growing up watching all those cartoons back in the day and just, you know, just experiencing outside, you know, just playing with my neighbors or buying, you know, DVDs and, and, and Blu-rays and stuff like that. That's how I grew up in. And, you know, getting in tussles with some of our friends. I remember one time 
my friend and I were playing, I had a Ben 10 watch and he had a Hot Wheels track. You know, you put the cars down so they could go down. And we got yeah. and we were playing around. I think I hit him by accident with the Ben 10 watch. He picks up the Hot Wheels track and goes whack and slams me so hard into my shoulder. I started crying. <laughs> it was a terrible mm -hmm. experience. And then I, got yeah. and I broke his toy in half and threw it away. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Well, I mean, like uh, where I grew up wasn't like that. You know, it was when I went into this when I when I started going into Manhattan. That was a different story because, like, when Manhattan in the seventies was just kind of it was just total chaos. I mean, obviously there were parts of it where there was like a lot of money, so you didn't ex you didn't have that kind of experience up there, you know. But when you get when you went further downtown, when you went into Alphabet City and places like that. It was a whole different story. I mean, it was it was it was potentially lethal. You know, what's interesting, though, is that no matter how like scary it was, no one ever got shot. Like you never heard about mass, a mass shooting ever kind of stuff. Didn't, like people just wouldn't just go off and, you know, find wind up in like a, you know, in a grocery store, you know, or whatever, and start like blowing people away like that. You know, it was much different. It was more personal. You know, obviously there were a lot of stuff was like drug related, you know, but it was a whole it was a whole different deal. That's crazy to me when you say that like times now are crazier than they were in the 60s like that. Just is so weird to like kind of compute for me because it's like, I don't know, it's, I feel like we should have progressed from that point, but it's like we're going <laughs> backwards. It's so, I mean, you can't help but to laugh at it because it's like so insane how we're at the point we're at now. It's kind of like we're going back in time. It's so weird. It's so weird. Well, shit is always, isn't always the same as is. You know, I mean, evolution is supposed to mean forward, but like a lot of times in history, it hasn't worked like that. You know, I mean, the Dark Ages were a, uh, you know, were definitely a regression from the, the Roman Empire. You know, I mean, things things really fell apart for, you know, for like a, inside of a thousand years. I mean, it was like it, Europe was a complete mess. I mean, the States is, <laughs> it's not, not so good right now, as I'm sure you can attest. You know, it's a scary place. Definitely, and it really does go back to what you're saying, just trying to find order in, in the chaos and trying to keep peace in your own home and in your own reality, in your own bubble and trying to make other people's days better by like talking to them or, you know, just, just reaching out and doing something as simple as that, just a small act of kindness or surrounding your stuff, uh, yourself with stuff you love. I mean, obviously you can see tons of stuff I love behind me. And just Look at that. Myself. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. We're talking about music and stuff like that. So <laughs> rather than trying to fix the, 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 the state of the world's disrepair, let's carry on. <laughs> yeah. I wonder, that makes me want to go into my next question. Is like you talk about sound and uh, hearing stuff better, which really reminds me of one of my uh, good friends, Corey Burton, the big voice actor who's really tuned into to sound and being able to mimic voices and create characters like that. really reminds me of sort of something to that. And I know as you got older, your first uh, instrument was a synthesizer, correct? A micro mood synthesizer? That's right, yeah. Yeah, you did your homework, right? Always, always. Hmm. <laughs> it's more interesting nice. than my school homework, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> hmm. But how would you describe your first experiments with playing with the synthesizer and sound? And what effect did that leave on you going forward? Um, you mean as far as how it was when I first got this instrument? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I mean, like, I didn't know anything about it. I'd always been obsessed with synthesizers, and I just saved up money to buy one. And I started playing around with it. And it was, you know, I mean, it didn't sound exactly like recordings that I, that, you know, I heard synthesizers, uh, because it was a slightly more rudimentary version. Uh, but it was close enough for me and it was exciting and I could do lots of fun things with it. And, you know, I mean, it, it really, it really changed, it changed my life. And, uh, I was interested in sound and things like that from the time I was really small. So it, 
you know, it gave me the opportunity to play to play with other musicians, you know, just to kind of develop and hone whatever it was that I was trying to do. I mean, I really didn't have a plan going forward. I just kind of fell into everything. Uh, eventually, I did learn how to how to uh, operate a synthesizer and what all the functions were on it. Uh, but I kind of got into it um, ass backwards. Uh, <laughs> you know, which is a good way to get into things sometimes. And it was fun. You know, it was really, it was a lot of f fun for me growing up and learning about other synthesizers, what, synth you know, what, all, what synthesizers did, what they had in common, what they didn't have in common, how some of them are individual modules that you have to patch together and how the one I had was pre was internally patched, hardwired. So, you know, it was a much different type thing. Um, it was it, all 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 the way around. It's been a great experience um, working with those instruments. I I still love them. That reminds me of just me falling into like the acting thing when you talk about doing it ass backwards. It reminds me of just how much like, mm. I just love uh, how I fell in love with acting in the beginning and just how I've kind of done things backwards, <laughs> trying to get into mm -hmm. the acting industry. But you know, when you find that thing, when you find your calling, it's just like easier to dive into and to fall in into in love with even when sometimes the task is grading you know it's what you're destined to do it's your calling and it's just more easier to to get accustomed to it you know so yeah in that yeah yeah awesome. absolutely well of course from there with your synthesizer you went on to play with bill as well in a band called material and I, would you say that was your first uh, time being musical or being with a band um, I played, I mean, I jammed around with a bunch of other people before, but that was, Material really was my first band. Um, you know, we all got together. It was uh, Bill and myself, a guy named Fred Moore, and a guitarist named Cliff Coltrary. And, you know, we just started jamming, and we, you know, we, we played some shows and eventually became this little aggregate. Then we started playing around town. One thing led to another. You know, it was just really strange how things evolved. You know, I mean, it was kind of, it was kind of star-crossed in a way. Like, I, I don't, I know people who've been play, who, who played for years and didn't have the kind of experience that I had. It was, uh, let's put it this way, I, I feel very fortunate. Within five years of starting out creating this, creating this band, I go from I go from that, you know, and touring in, in this like beat up old school bus to writing music and for and, and producing songs for Herbie Hancock. That was that was kinda that was a pretty big jump. Absolutely. And you know, you've done done a ton of stuff thanks to that uh, band and like you said, Herbie Hancock, which we're gonna get into that mass i listened to rock a rocket for the first time because i was like oh you know this is a big uh i'm keep hearing this is a big song so i'm gonna listen to it before i speak to you and man y'all kicked ass on that <laughs> that was that's a really good song oh my god just i love the scratch tables and just i just love how it sounds i love it i love i love sound too you know i and it, it sounds good and it's authentic hip-hop and i really love it and this takes you back to i can imagine someone carrying the boom box and doing a little break dance to it i just that's oh yeah the scenario that would play in my head with that song how would you say your time and material helped you grow as an artist and to add on to that what lessons did you take from your time there that you still carry with you to this day? Uh, a lot, really. Um, from being in material, I kind of learned how to not treat people. <laughs> 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 because the guy I was in material with was one of the most um, misanthropic people I think I've ever met in my entire life. And, uh, you know, I, I think after I was in material, I think I, and while I was in material, I kind of treated people the same way because I was sort of like a bit of a mini me in that whole, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I'm just be, I'm just being honest about it. You know, I mean, I, I was also, I was like, I was young. I was like 23. I was, you know, in my te late teens and early 20s through this whole time. And, uh, 
you know, it was, I was kind of like the duck in, in, in that story. Are you my mother? You know, I was kind of, <laughs> this guy was kind of like a figurehead for me. So I was kind of like, oh, you know, I act like him, do that, you know. But then, <laughs> you know, I found really quickly that, you know, if you're, if you're not nice to people or you, you can't find a way to be able to interact with people, um, even if you have the greatest possible idea imaginable, to help make their music better, they're not going to be very receptive. <laughs> so I learned a lot after that experience about how to interact properly with people, how to be respectful to people, um, how to be uh, courteous, and the importance of the, the importance of collaboration. You know, not acting as if you're sort of like the only person who's really responsible for something being great. Like, obviously the process requires a team, you know, and even if you're the, even if you're the leader, you're still, you're still minding a bunch of other people who have functions that you yourself can't do. You have to consider that at all times. You have to be able to, you know, I, I don't like to use the word manage because it sounds like you're controlling people. You know, but you have to, to, to be a good leader, you have to understand how to work with those dynamics and how to, you know, how to recognize what each person needs from moment to moment. Like some people at certain points really do need a really hard kick in the ass, you know, and at other points in the process, people need to be, they need to be cared for. They need to be handled gently with kindness and one thing across the board is people that you're working with always need to know that you have their backs, that you're going to be there to support them. And that if they go into the, if they're going into the trenches for anything, you're going in too, that they don't have to feel like they're on their own and that you're going to support them and back them up all the way to the end point. And that's an important thing to share with people to let them know that you're at least as committed to what they do. That really, uh, that that's something that inspires people tremendously, and I, I've just seen so often how people people's egos really kind of prevent them from being able to do that, and the end result in in situations like those are never as good as they would have been if there had just been an emphasis on, hey, we're working together. We are a team here. This is this is what the dynamic is like. I have your back, you have my back. You know, if, if we go into the trenches, we go in together. That's the way it is. And we don't stop until we get to where we need to go. This is why I brought you on, man. <laughs> because, yeah. What was I that, right? Said that any better. Seriously, that, that is a true tried and true message and one i've suffered with a lot too because i've just been so so prideful over a lot of things personally you know over whether it be like something i'm writing or or something i'm recording i'm just so meticulous about things and so just wanting to be the head of it and not ask people for help or or even when i'm going through something just being silent on certain things and not reaching out and being more open you know it's really important to to be interactive with your team and and people who are in your life and important to you and let them know what's going on so they can help you through those periods in your life so I, 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 that is something that i'm still working on i'm not fully there yet but um you know so. it's a life's work you know i think i just i found that pride is really great when you're bouncing your children your grandchildren on your knee you know and showing them like your your awards and stuff like that and say hey i did this i did that you know, the rest of the world, like, I, I discovered that the rest of the world doesn't really need to know um, un unless it's unless there's a relevance to it, you know, unless there's something, un unless there's a, there's a specific value to doing so. Like, it's, it's fine and good to do stuff like that on social media, especially if you're trying to use it to sell yourself. That, I mean, which, that all makes perfect sense. It's fine. To do things like that as kind of like a as, as like a, an ego stroke or something like that, you know. I mean, I guess if you need it, I can't say I, I can't say anything about it one way or another. That's fine. That's your thing, but 
as if it's not to me if it's not purposeful there's no point in doing it if there's purpose to saying like hey i did this that's that's fine but really it's better off down the road when you're trying to share people in your life that are that are close to you you know, share that because i mean the spoils of of things like that of things that that are that are successful and that have affected other people profoundly like i i i i get royalties from records that i've worked on i can i can look around and 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 see what all that has brought me over the years and it's a beautiful thing i don't need to i don't need to tell everyone about it you know it doesn't do any let's put it this way after i've done the telling unless it was for something that was necessary it does absolutely nothing for me at all is that why you don't have you plaques a, on your room because i was like i don't see any like plaque or or, or like thing or like oh no they're on the other side oh i haven't i haven't put them up yet i'm actually expecting a small shift <laughs> in a few <laughs> in 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 a few weeks uh you know but actually since you asked <laughs> i will you mentioned you mentioned rocket let's see if there that's a that's a small that's a, a small wall of of uh of plaques devoted to 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 um herbie's record one of which by the way is th and this is something that i'm quite proud of a uh and I, I can blow my own horn here because you did invite me to come on your show. Uh, <laughs> is a is a plaque for uh, which I don't, which is a very unusual one. It's actually a plaque from Sony Music for the most, uh, the biggest selling 12 inch of all time, which as it turns out was was Rocket. It sold 3 million 12 inches and that made it the biggest selling 12 inch, at least at Sony. Uh, at Sony Music of all time. So, there you go. Wow, that is so fucking cool. Oh my God, <laughs> that's so cool. That is awesome. I'm kind of proud of that one. I would be too, listen. People, where I'm at currently in my life, I'm telling everybody. <laughs> I'm gonna hide it, I'm telling all of you without you asking anything. <laughs> that is really <laughs> cool to, to, to have something like that to, like goes back to what I was saying in the beginning, just being able to be like, damn, I really did that. I have the plaque. I have the, I, I have this to, to tell people and let them know how far I've come in my career from, you know, that little shot eye little kid who didn't know what they were doing to, with a synthesizer to now producing albums that have gone multi-platinum across the world and just winning multiple awards right that's a or in or even creating stuff like the fresh sample one of the most used samples in hip-hop history i mean you've had an effect on hip-hop history man like that's incredible that's incredible actually that's the most sampled sound in all of recorded music history what i yep got that wrong see See? Look at that. That's so cool. Being able yeah. to do stuff like that, man. And, and knowing it's had a long-lasting effect on an industry that you love so much is only something I can hope to achieve as an artist myself. That is incredible. It's, uh, you know, it's good. <laughs> well, you know, of course your time with Material came to a close and you went on to really get into this producing thing and you wound up going mm. to work with the red hot chili peppers was your first big one right working with that band well it wasn't big actually it was uh because the chili peppers were kind of like the red-headed stepchildren at emi records at that point like they didn't know what to do with them they didn't like them they you know it, it was a very it was a very uncomfortable relationship and consequently no one wanted to produce them and at that point in my life i couldn't get arrested so i was desperate for work but i was also turning down stuff because a lot of the stuff that i did get offered it was just stuff i where i would hear the music and i would go i can't i just can't and i need to pay my rent and you know the the bills were about to be all, all my utilities were going to be shut off and i i couldn't like Fortunately, I was able to eat, 
but you know, I was running low. I was running low on cash all the time, but I just couldn't do it. And then when I went, I, I met with an A and R guy at EMI, and he gave me this cassette tape of the Chili Peppers, and I heard it, and it was just awful. And I, you know, but like there was something in it that I heard that was that made it really compelling, and I was like, you no, know, I, I really, this could be really interesting. So we obviously met and connected and I wound up doing two records with them and it was it was quite a it was a really amazing process because I helped take them from where they were which were essentially a bunch of feral street kids from Los Angeles to a point where they could do whatever they wanted and it was a it was a really extraordinary process watching that happen there was so much drama it was it was wild and it was a lot of hard work but obviously it was worth it in the end i mean look at them now i think of songs like uh, california cation which is that that song that i was like oh i hope michael did it but of course he worked on that earlier stuff i love that song that's such a a big song in their career that they made yep. and and yeah they, just look at them now they're touring all over the world now and you know I, yeah that's right i think i just saw them in um i think it was france i think they were in france recently but they're they're touring right now so that's awesome yeah that's right put them uh in and i think of a story that you told about uh getting into it with anthony the lead singer and how you like cussed him out because he he kept missing rehearsals and stuff like that and how you just set him on the straight and narrow i guess in that sense was the uh, I I didn't. I actually fired him. <laughs> fired him off. Fired him off. That and I was. I remember hearing that story. I was like, Did he really do that? And I know even Flea was like, You can't do that. And you were like, Well, I just. <laughs> I was like, What the? That's crazy. Yeah, yeah, it was. It's not something that a record producer is supposed to do. But uh, at that point, things had just gotten so far out of hand that. Uh, I think that we're that at that point I was reaching for str at any straw I could grab hold of, and that was the one that was most that was most available to me. So I took it. You fully understand, man. And, and I know yeah. when it comes to to dealing with people who have addictions and stuff like that. It can sometimes sometimes be really hard dealing with that because you know it seems like Anthony was putting his drug addiction with uh, heroin and stuff above the music and the other guys in the band it was really affecting the band um, yeah yeah from a per personal level and it's just crazy to to see like i said just to see that transformation into who they are today um and yeah it's been, wonderful have you been have you uh, have, have you been in touch with them since then talk about all the success they've gotten or um no not really I mean, I've spoken to Fle I, I think I speak to Flea once every 10 years or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> once every decade? That's What's that? I said once every decade? That's crazy. Something like that, yeah. Wow. What was it like going uh, from more hip-hop and electronic stuff into what you do are mainly known for rock with people like Hole and Korn and such? Um, it was a it was a weird transition, but not completely inappropriate. I mean, I felt that I was able. I didn't really like most rock music when I got when I started making it. So I started to realize that that made me an ideal candidate for producing it because it made me much less tolerant of things that would be cliche in in the uh, in the genre and. Uh, I, and it's also a reason why I didn't wind up working on, I guess, records that would have been more typically rock. But I think working with electronics and working with more beat oriented and dance oriented music and hip hop, I was able to bring some of that kind of consciousness over to the records that I did be, with, with guitars because most rock records after the 70s and I guess the early 80s, they really started to de-emphasize their focus on the rhythm section. Like when you listen to rock records, 
not so much in the 60s like they start they did definitely send it thin but i mean most everyone's record sent it thin back in the 60s uh you know but like in the in the 70s when you had bands like like led zeppelin i mean obviously john bonham and john paul jones like they 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 understood r&b so they had like a really deep bottom and the bass drum on those records is really heavy it's very very present so is the bass guitar in fact the bass guitar in some songs is louder in the mix than the guitar is and that comes from listening to that comes from r&b that there's so much focus on the bass guitar but as time went on and the 80s drew on and then into the 90s people started moving in guitar based music to the guitar and making it louder and louder and making it more mid-rangey and starting to lose sight of the rhythm section and all of a sudden these records start to sound really thin and glassy and they didn't have any groove to them you know because you had a drummer but like what was he really doing you had a bass player but what was he really doing i mean eventually all the bass player did was like you know root note da 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 root note change da 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 you know and you don't have people moving around like you would say in a Led Zeppelin record where the bass is actually quite frequently doing stuff to play off the vocal to kind of create like a counter melodic thing happening it's very subtle because obviously the bass is a deeper instrument you know whereas the vocal is is over here so you're paying you're not paying attention to this one back there you're paying attention to the one that's directly in your face meanwhile the one behind there is snaking around doing all this cool stuff and it makes the music more interesting you're just not aware of how it is or why it is but it but it's there you know as as rock music got more guitar, focused on guitars and people screeching and stuff like that and they weren't as inter- weren't there wasn't as much focus on like on, on the drums and on the bass uh the rhythm section stuff started to get it started to get sloppier and it just wasn't as focused and it seemed like more of an afterthought than anything else and my thing was to that i i was so attuned to those elements in an in a recording i really focused heavily on those and on records that i've done you can hear that there is more bass and that the drums are more focused that there's more punch to them and because they have to move like you've got it you have to be able to get a groove no matter what kind of music it is that you're listening to if it's pop music of any variety my feeling is is that you've got to feel the groove there's got to be a pulse that makes your body go like this because that makes music more interesting it just does i definitely agree and i do hear those and that's why you're one of, in my honest opinion one of the best producers for the genre because of how you did that i love drums i love drums and i love bass because of just you know when you talk about the groove and, and the rhythm of it i love that so much and i love how prominent a lot of those elements are in the albums that you've worked on because i just i, I love drums so much and you know it is interesting when you mentioned that because I, i i do notice that with a lot of uh, records rock records then it's it's more like you said focus on guitar and, and screeching and stuff is like there there isn't as much bass and groove to it that really makes it great like you know i think of like grunge music music which you worked on of course with chris cornell and soundgarden they, they you find more of the rhythmy stuff there um more primarily for for grunge at that time so yeah i mean you can i i i i didn't care for the way a lot of those records sounded which was one reason why i wanted to make sure that i could i my focus was on trying to make a record that would be dirty and aggressive but at the same time where everything is very clear and audible which is kind of a weird dichotomy to try and find some sort of like parody where everything works in that equation to me that was the whole point of making super unknown the way that we did that record is beautiful i really like i have to say you did a phenomenal job with that with chris and the guys that album is one of my all time favorite albums of all time like Thank i you. love the record uh, oh no 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 like that it's just it's so powerful and chris's vocals on that are just 
out of this world. I think of Black Hole Sun. I was listening to uh, the vocals just isolated and Chris just singing. It's like, Jesus, this man was really going heavy with, with how he was more emotional and more intimate with those those vocals. And I, I just loved it. I love that record top to bottom. Such a good album that you guys produced. Thanks. Yeah, it's I, I'm very proud of that. And we just found out that it's a 10 million worldwide. So that's good. Another one of those accomplishments, baby. That's add them up. Add them. <laughs> keep them coming. Keep them coming. You know. Um, yeah. I'm very, I'm very interested in, like I said, in the producing process. And you know, I'm when I think of producing, I think of like, you know, when it comes to like hip hop and rap, I think of someone like making a beat and and stuff like that. But I'm curious, how does producing for a rock album work? Do you have to like make a beat or like, how do you like come together to make projects like you have? We, there's so many different approaches to production depending on what the genre of music is that you're working in as you've obviously illustrated there uh in a, on a rock record it, see the thing is is that within each genre everyone has their own way of doing it though i'd say in hip-hop it's probably more specific because as the producer you do have to come up with the beats and and, and essentially the entire track but a lot of people in rock they just you know they just kind of cheerlead They'll just say everything's good and kind of and, and make a, a good vibe for people. The way I tend to work is I I help with the art. I help the artist at every 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 stage of of the process, making sure that they've got all the right songs for the record for the recording. And if they're lacking anything, if I feel they're lacking anything, I just bring it to their attention and try and be a responsible shepherd, I guess, to the whole process until we get to the point where everyone agrees that there's the right quantity and the right variety and the right quality of of music that's going to be appropriate for this particular project and then working on logistics organizing the sessions organize get it, figuring out who's going to be recording everything what kind of equipment we're going to use where we're going to be recording it's it, you know it, it's a whole process really working on song arrangements and obviously rehearsing with the artists when they're in pre-production, making sure the performances are as good as they, as they can possibly be. And then going into a recording studio and really, and working with the artists to make sure, because when you get into a recording studio, it's a whole different atmosphere than being in a rehearsal studio. So, trying to help the artist if they're you know if, if there's a little bit of discomfort helping them acclimate to the change in environment and getting the best possible performances out of the artist that they can possibly deliver and making sure from a listener's perspective that everything that i would want to hear is working like the instruments have the right sound the right kind of presence i don't like to apply a specific template to every project that I work on. Some people do that. Some people just have their thing that they kind of work to more of a plug and play type type thing. But I feel each recording is sort of like a bespoke type experience and it requires its own sounds, its own sonics and guitars or, you know, whatever instrumentation there is. Obviously, each vocalist is different too. So we have to use different vocal mics on people. And I, I like to approach it on a case by case basis. Just it's more spontaneous that way. And just I, I just deal with everything as it comes at me, more or less. I under, completely understand, you know, and it does, when you break it down like that, that makes a, a ton of sense. Like each artist is different and, you know, each type of sound you're trying to go for is different. So, you know, you have to apply a different type of methods than you usually would use for for a certain type of record. Um, it, it would change from album to album, which is interesting. Uh, thank you for clarifying that for me, because I've always I've always wondered how that works, because, you know, like you said, with hip hop, it's very much more specific in what the producer uh, usually does. So when it comes to different other genres, I'm, I'm very curious how that process works. So. Yeah. Making a record that way is definitely more more involved because as the producer, in this case, I'm not specifically involved in songwriting. I can be if the artist needs it, but 
in a lot of cases, people do that because it's more of a business decision. It's like, how can I make more money off these people? For me, my feeling is, is that there's a certain ethic to making a record. And I would prefer to stick to that because ultimately, if I try and take on too many jobs and too many responsibilities in the process, I'm going to spread, I'm going to spread myself thin and then I'm not functioning as well doing my fulfilling my primary responsibility which is to produce the record i have to be able to provide the oversight also it changes your perspective on things like all of a sudden if i'm the producer and a songwriter you know i i'm looking at things from two completely different perspectives and there's going to be a conflict of interest my objectivity is going to change drastically i have a different focus on things obviously my uh my, my my interest in the in, in the recording at that point winds up being multiplied or quantified it, it winds up being yeah multiplied because i i have and the set there's like a tremendous need for me now for the record to be successful because if i'm a songwriter that means i need to th i need to be thinking about how am i going to make publishing royalties off this so i want to make sure that any song that i'm working on is going to be is going to be the most successful song you know, at, at least more successful. But I can't look at it the same way as I would as a, you know, from the point of view of being a producer at that point. If I'm trying to be a producer, I might be in a position where I say, where I know from an artistic perspective, I don't necessarily want to make this a more commercial sounding record, but something where we take more chances, something that's more interesting and unusual that goes against the grain. I would rather be in that position for the sake, for the artist's sake, to get so that they can have something that's going to work better for them. Whether it works better for me in the long run as an equity participant in terms of royalties, that's that's a whole different matter. I don't really, but I I, I don't want to have that be a deciding factor in how I work. I would rather have me at my best be what what what's the 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 most decide the the biggest deciding factor in the process for any opinions or or work that i do on behalf of the artist well that leads me into this question as well you know i come from the acting world i speak to tons of actors um who you know the audition is huge getting on to to multiple projects or cartoons so i'm wondering yes I'm Okay, cool. Sorry, someone called me. I hate when people do that. I'm, you know, I'm live. Why are you calling? Don't, don't do that. Anyways, sorry about that. I apologize. But um, well, we're was, lucky no one's called me yet. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, yeah, it's. Oh, I hate when that happens. But how do you? Okay. Do you, how do you end up producing for any of these albums? Period. Like, do you have to audition? Are you recommended? How does that work? Well, it depends. I mean, some records that I've done. I was at that point in time, people, a lot of people wanted to work with me. So I would meet with the artist and they would say like, you're on board. I'd say yes. And that would be it. For other records, I would have to go meet with the artist and they would decide if they wanted to work with me. And normally on projects like those, there would be a bunch of other people. So we were all vying. It, was, it would be like a bunch of contractors who you want to hire to build your house who's going to get the contract. You know what I mean? So <laughs> there was always a lot of tension involved in that. You know, I was always like, did I get it? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Definitely. Okay, I got that. That's cool that you get to a point where people want to work with you so much. They're like, I want Michael Beinhorn. I want him. I want him. And they're like, kind of like fighting, fighting for you to, to make that album because you have a... a, a, a what am I trying to say? Oh, I'm not so bad with words today. Um, <laughs> you have a Don't worry song. about it. I have that problem all the time. <laughs> right? It's like you're trying to find the perfect word or what you're trying to say. It's just, it sometimes gets jumped. It happens all the time. <laughs> Were you going to say that you've got a resume that's strong enough that people will just go for, will, will just want to, will just want to hire you on the spot? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, it's, um... It's really cool to, to hear that. I'm also interested on your take on this. 
I'm going to pull up this quote right here, and I'm interested, as you are a producer yourself, T-Pain, um, of course, very well known for his producing and doing stuff like that and mm -hmm. making huge pop hits back in the early 2000s. He says that, quote, he said this actually last year of uh, May 10th. He said, the producers are the ones that deserve all the clout because y'all don't really be liking these songs. Y'all really just like the beats. I'm interested on your take on that quote. Do you agree with him that you guys deserve more credit than you get? Are you happy with the credit? Because when I see that you have like 3,000 followers on Instagram or 1,000 on Twitter, I'm like, you deserve like at least, at least 100,000 for all the all the awesome records you've made. You know what I mean? Like, you deserve at least Wow, well, that's very kind of you. Yeah, um, definitely. But like, how do you feel about that quote? Um... Well, you have to remember that he's talking about a completely different genre of music than the one that I work in. Right. He's basically, he's talking about a genre where the producer creates all the background music and everything that happens on the top is generally something that the artist comes in with or someone who works with the artist. In a lot, in some cases, I'm not even sure that the artist actually does their own writing and they might have something like stuck right in front of them. It depends who the artist is, of course. There's plenty of people who, who, who do come up with their own stuff and are extremely talented. But you have to remember, in, in, in the genre of music where people are playing instruments, I'm, I'll use that as like a broader spectrum rather than saying rock or, you know, whatever. Uh, there, there are generally, so there are often songwriters. Although these days almost everyone's songs are being written by like groups of people who sit down and write songs together, which is a, unfortunately does not yield the best results for a variety of reasons. But if we're going to, if we're going to idealize this, uh, we're going to refer back to the old model, which is essentially one person or maybe two people sitting down writing a song together that they were eventually going to perform themselves. So everything was done in house. So there's a certain attachment to it. Like there's a certain connection to the song that the artist who's writing it and who's eventually going to perform it has. So if you've got all those things, if you've got that kind of connection, that kind of investment in it, and it's a, and the it happens to be something that came directly from a person's soul, like it was something that they really wanted to say and they could say it so well, you basically have everything going for it. At that point, what I'm doing as a producer is providing some really great window dressing for that song. Now, sometimes the window dressing is pretty profound. I will, I mean, I, I will, I'll die on this hill <laughs> that, that Super Unknown wouldn't have been the record that it was if I hadn't, if it, if it hadn't sounded the way it did. For that matter, it wouldn't have been the record it was if I hadn't, if, if I hadn't been directly working with those guys and I wouldn't, I, I don't like to use the word pushing them, but encouraging them to write better songs. Black Hole Sun wouldn't exist. A lot of the other songs on the record that, that were very big wouldn't have existed if I hadn't gotten into that stance with them in that relationship. Uh, so producers do deserve credit, but do we need it? No. I don't need it. And it goes back to what I was saying before. I don't I don't need to lionize myself or get into like the public eye to kind of go, hey, I did this. Hey, I did that. If you know my work, you know my work. That's what matters to me. If you're going to listen, if you're going to stream songs that I produced, that's what matters to me. I'm going to get my royalties from that. You know, that's what matters to me because I want to I want to take care of my family. I'm proud of the, like, my pride for these records is unending. In fact, I'll go a step further and say that a lot of these records are like children to me. They're like my family. You know, I have a deep and unending love for them. You know, like, Ro Rocket is like, is like my oldest child. Like, it's 38 years old or something like that. Wait, no, it's four, it's going to be four, it's 39, it's going to be 40 next, you know, so... My oldest child is a middle is middle aged, you know, and it's been out in the world for decades. You know, it's been it's it's been a proper person in the world. 
it's worked hard you know it's worked for itself and it's given back to me too and everyone else who worked on it as well but i think i'm probably the only person who worked on it who has that kind of relationship with it like i love it i love it like i would love a person and the same is true for super unknown and uh, and and you know I, and most of the other records i've worked on i have that kind of relationship with those records they're very meaningful to me and they and i feel that they love me back and it's a very it's a very special feeling that's in many ways more magical to me because i feel i do feel that i birthed these things on super unknown i didn't write a note of music but if i hadn't been there it would have been a completely different record it wouldn't have been anything like it is you know so i'm kind of like it's midwife and i have a very strong connection to that record and i know how it feels about me too <laughs> <laughs> the same is true for herbie's record and and and, and for holes and and manson's record and and the and corn's record they're very special i put a tremendous amount of work into these things i don't need someone telling me how i i should rephrase this because when people come to me and say things about about recordings that i've done that have been meaningful it means the world to me like it, it it makes my day because i know that i did something that changed the person's life that affected a person deep in their soul and opened something up in them that that helped them see the world in a completely different way maybe for an instant maybe for the rest of their lives you know that's something that you can't touch so i i can i can come on your i can come on your your show and tell you about that but I I if if the rest of the world finds out about that that's that's wonderful great good for them but no seriously like I I I know how I feel about it like what it means to me and it's a really it's a, just a deep beautiful sensation you know to to know that I brought that I help I either brought or helped bring these things into the world and that they're there being like people and thinking about me and bringing you know bring and bringing me love as well it's an ex- like it's it's an extraordinary feedback loop that is definitely something that can't be can't be touched by anything to know that there's so much of so much love like that in the world it's 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 extraordinary damn 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 yeah that makes a lot of sense when when you phrase it like that so so you're more so like I already got the credit. I already got the satisfaction from producing and being able to help bring this great beautiful in your words person into this world that has influenced and helped so many people through the lyrics or the way it sounds or how you help arrange this part here and there. Um you are already satisfied with that and you, and you don't need anyone else telling you like you don't need 100,000 people following you on like Instagram or something. If someone else wants to talk about it that's great. I like the work that I'm doing right now and that's really what social media that's the value that social media has for me at this point to be able to do outreach for stuff like that which I I I'm going to start doing I I'm, I'm going to be able to start doing more within the next like 2-3 months I think. as as far as as far as lionizing myself and going like hey i don't get enough credit for this i don't get enough credit for that you know to me that's just I, and nothing against t pain or anyone else who who wants that if you need that that's fantastic you should have it and you should get it like do everything that you can to get it if that's what you need for me no i don't want it i don't i don't I don't need it. If someone wants to tell me how they feel about what I've done, I love it. I'm open. I will always be open and I always thank people sincerely for doing that. Definitely. That speaks to me too, man. Just, you know, doing stuff like this or doing like interviews and many interviews I've done, you know, I, it just it's just always an honor or and, and I'm proud of every single one I've done cuz it's like I've helped, you know, do do this and and I've helped 
bring allow an artist to tell their story that you know i hope influences someone i hope makes their day or makes them laugh by me and yours banter or you know just this story about how you feel about the many projects you've done or or an actor talking about how they love the character that they've brought to life in this one cartoon and how that character has helped influence it's such a beautiful domino effect that art is that's why i love the line of work that I'm involved in because art is just so beautiful in that sense you know we never know what something you created is going to do for someone or or how that's going to affect you later in your life and other people's lives it's, it's a beautiful domino effect yes yeah it is absolutely well I want to talk about corn because uh, that's untouchables is a beautiful project i love that album so much um, like i said recently turned 20 really really great um that was their fifth album right untouchables was it's their fifth solo project i think so yeah yeah because it, it went self-titled then follow the leader then i think life is peachy then i think issues yeah yeah yep yeah, yep yeah, yeah, that it was the fifth one yeah so I'm interested how you got involved with the corn guys because I was reading on your website that it seemed at the beginning that they didn't really like you. <laughs> they didn't really like you as much. You guys didn't really hit it off as much, but you wound up uh, producing this one. So how did you wind up working with the corn boys and were you aware of their success prior to working with them? Oh yeah, sure. We actually met about producing a record right before they did um, Life is Peachy. No, Follow the Leader, excuse me before they did follow the leader that was actually the third one and uh <clears throat> and we had such a bad meeting uh that i i felt very confident that i'd never see those guys again in this life uh and <laughs> Jesus, I can't, that bad? <laughs> it was it was terrible yeah no it was really bad i i think i inadvertently insulted uh one or all of them and they in turn insulted me and excuse me we it was probably the worst meeting i'd ever had with a band at that point actually so i was really excuse me i was really surprised when how many years later was, yeah 2000 2001 their management reached out to me again i was like oh well the first time didn't put them off completely wow <laughs> You know, so we sat down and met, and it was really funny because it was a completely different atmosphere. I think we were just we'd all we'd all grown up at that point, and we we just we sort of hit it off, and uh, and they'd actually met with a bunch of other people as well. So at the end, when they were doing when. It's funny because they made a, a video documentary of the process of making that record. And when they were when they were choosing, when they chose me, they, they all agreed that they wanted the asshole. That was me to do the record. So, yeah, we, we want the asshole. <laughs> <laughs> they, they still thought I was an asshole, I think, from the, the time that we met before. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen some of that documentary. Of course, it's, uh, it's really old, so it's not as as polished as you know a video doc making documentary would be to this day but it was still interesting to see some of what it went into it and them eventually choosing you and yeah they they did they they even said aka the asshole when they referred to you as a one of the yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know this is i find the album so interesting because of how how it sounds and and it sonically and how what Jonathan did and I want to talk about Jonathan a little bit you know Jonathan Davis talks about how this album and you specifically helped make him a better singer or in his words made him a real singer um and I'm curious if you can pinpoint or explain a little like what were some of the issues you were hearing when you were hearing Jonathan's voice on some of the songs or was it missing something were you not sad like what happened with that it wasn't, there wasn't any specific issue. It was more that when we started recording his vocals, I created this like, this, this enormous landscape of sound and he just couldn't compete with it. Like his, his voice really wasn't in the shape to be able to do what he needed to do. And he wound up blowing it out really fast. Like he lost his voice within a day. 
it was it was a lot, you know. But I, I didn't. I I wanted to make something that would sonically that would represent the band at their absolute height. I didn't feel that their other records, as good as they were, that they that they were sonically where I would place those guys. Whether they're whether the records are good or not doesn't figure into that. I just didn't feel that they were sonically strong enough, and I wanted to create something that would be more of a masterpiece from a sonic point of view. I just was thinking about all kinds of crazy ways to record it and what it would be like, and and we I feel that we really achieved it. So when it was time to to do his vocals, he he couldn't he couldn't match the 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 instrumental part of it. So. He wound up agreeing to see a、uh, a vocal coach who I took him to, named Ron Anderson, who sadly passed away earlier this year. And、uh, Ron worked with Jonathan. Jonathan was very opposed initially, you know, because he didn't want. He thought he was going to make him sound like a Broadway singer, which was definitely not what Ron did at all. And I explained to him, John, John, look, he's not going to, he's not going to take away any part of who you are. He's just going to help you do it with greater efficiency, and that's what happened. And that, and and through that experience, Jonathan really developed more strength and more power in his voice. And obviously, the proof is in the pudding because those are some of the best vocals I think that he that he's done on a recording. They're just they're magnificent, really. And the best part of it was that at the end of it. He was just so proud of everything that he'd done, and all the work that he put into the record. And it was really a, a monolithic undertaking. And it was just, it was so hard to make the record. But I feel that we all came out of out the other end of it, and certainly, at least, at very least, mo- maybe most of all, Jonathan, a completely a changed person. He really had much greater insight into what he was doing. And I'm proud. I'm I'm proud to have participated in that. I I, I treasure Jonathan as a person, as as a friend, and as and as a collaborator. I think he's 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 a brilliant man, and he's he's extremely creative and 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 very talented. I completely agree. I mean, man, look like whether I now I think they're on their fifteenth album now. I mean, with Rec Room that just came out earlier this year. I mean. They're still going at it, still touring, and Jonathan sounds amazing. Like he still sounds great. I mean, I can't really tell the the difference now, even though he's gotten older in his voice. I mean, he still sounds as great as the day he first started with、um, with self titled. It's a beautiful thing to to see that and to hear you say such high、uh, compliments about him and how he feels so proud of Untouchables. I mean, he says even he says. In interviews currently, that this is still to his day, Untouchables is still his favorite Corn album. Like he loves that project, and that's awesome to hear you guys come out very prouder, uh, prouder. <laughs> if that's a word, but more proud of the product. Well, like, we have to accept it. Yeah, you just invented. You just made the word. It is. It's good. Let's go. <laughs> we we got to roll with it. <laughs> prouder, yeah, and.、Um, I'm just so glad that you guys made this. Like I said, I've listened to it multiple times, and there's so many good tracks on there. Here I Stay was a phenomenal choice to open the project. Alone I Break, Thoughtless.、Um, you know, there's just a lot of stuff on there sonically too that just sounds really cool, and they didn't haven't really touched before. But prior to working with you, I just felt like. Sonically was very different, and that you wanted to do that, and man, you succeeded with flying colors. It's it. You really did your thing. You and Jonathan Thank you. with this, and yeah, of course. Um, of one thing that's associated with you, want to talk about this、uh, joke a little bit? Of course, your firing of drummers, and I was <laughs> I was curious, what was your experience with at the time the drummer was David?、Uh, I'm not gonna say his last name. I know it starts with the S. Silvera. Silvera. Ooh, it's thundering. David Silvera. I'm sorry if you're thundering in the background. It's about to storm, I guess. But so,、uh, and、um, I know he had surgery for that current project. What was? Yeah. How was it working with David on drums? And was there any issues with recording with him? Uh, no. We his time was a little bit weird, but we managed to. 
we managed to compensate for that. He was playing to a click, and we did have to edit his drum tracks. But I would say that that's something that I I normally do. Although I don't edit drum tracks the way most people will, because usually they grid drum tracks. That, that what that means is if you're familiar if you're not familiar with the parlance of of recording technique. Usually when you record a drum track, you're a lot of times you're playing to a click, although some drummers don't some drummers don't need to and don't want to, and they usually sound much better for it. But um most most drummers will play to a click, but then when the performance is over, what happens is, is that an editor will go in and move every single hit that the drummer did in the digital recorder over to the nearest sixteenth note which means that you don't have a drum performance anymore. It sounds like a machine playing. That's one reason why a lot of records sound so stiff now, particularly like rock and pop records, because the drums are all gridded. And that's what it's called, that you grid, that you grid the drums because they're on a grid and you just line everything up precisely with 16th notes. And that, of course, takes the feel away because the groove is all about things kind of moving, you know, a downbeat if you're talking about drumming is a very loose concept you're talking about like a few microseconds or a few milliseconds here and there but that sway that difference is what defines often who the drummer actually is back in the old days if you listened if you lined like 10 drummers up all great and compared them how they hit and what their time was like, like where they put the down beats, the one, you know, the back beat, that would really tell you who the drummer actually was. Like if you took Charlie Watts, Ziggy Modaliste, um, John Bonham, and guys like those, and put them all together, play the same beat, you'd have like three completely different interpretations of the same type of groove. But when you grit a drum track, you take all that away. It's gone doesn't exist anymore so when I would have drums gridded I would make sure that there's a consistency in the performance not necessarily an accurate like a specific like clockwork accuracy because if you want if you want that why didn't you get a machine I just like to make sure that there's consistency in the groove if I can find a place where the groove is happening, we just want to make it feel as consistent as possible and at the same time make it sound like a human being was playing it. So there might be a little <clears throat> every so often, but if it's if it's that kind of thing that doesn't detract from the performance and also doesn't affect the other instruments that are playing along with it, that's fine. They, you know, David was just... David's time was, as I said, a little bit, it wasn't always on, so we just had to massage that a bit. But it wasn't bad, and he played very well on the record, so we were able to get, we were able to get really good drum takes out of him. That's interesting to hear you say that, and I wonder why the timing was off. Maybe it was due to the surgery, but Jonathan said in an interview, I don't know if he still feels uh, about this currently, he said he feels like after the first two records that David sort of lost his passion for drumming. And, and maybe didn't want to do it as much, um, which is interesting to hear because after Untouchables, you know, he stayed for a couple more years, but then left the band in 2006. And then I believe that's when Ray came on to be the new drummer. So it's interesting. I wonder if that had any play into it. I don't know. I guess we'll never know. But um, it is it is interesting to hear you tell that story um, about his um, timing being a little a little wacky. Not too bad, but. Um, I didn't notice that. Like, if you didn't tell me, I wouldn't have known. So, um, well, that's why we edited it. <laughs> Definitely. Leave it so you you won't you stuff. won't know. And you honestly, if you listened to the tracks raw before we'd edited them, I don't think that you would have detected that you would have detected anything especially bad about them either. But this was just it's just a process of tightening everything up so that the other instruments when they come down can play more accurately and so that the groove is is more consistent. I gotta ask about one of my favorite songs on the album, How, uh, Alone I Break, and of course you have a writing credit on that song as well. That song is just really different. There's a lot of electronics and it's just like a lot of, a lot of stuff going on there. And I was just curious, 
how did the Alone I Break come to be? And how did y'all record that song specifically? Well, interestingly enough, that was one that John created all by himself. Uh, he, it was funny because it was very atypical of all the other corn songs. And he brought me this demo and I heard it and I was like, oh my goodness. I was like, that is fantastic. You've got to finish it. I think he may, he may have come with the riff. I can't remember exactly how he first presented it to me. If it was just the riff or the song was practically finished. But I was like, you gotta. Yeah, there was definitely a process because he he went he went away and he finished it. He, he finished the he finished the bed like he finished all the instrumental stuff, all the vocals, all the vocal parts and the melodies came later. And it was I, I seem to recall that it was in like about a two day period when all this happened. And I just remember sitting in his car with him playing, playing me that song. And I was, I was like, wow, that's really, really awesome. And he was just looking at his hands going like, I can't believe I did this. <laughs> like, <laughs> I can't believe it. Cause he knew it was so awesome. It was great. It was wonderful watching him get that excited and realizing that he, that he'd written something really substantial. Because it is, it's a it's a very special piece of music, and it doesn't sound like anything else the band had uh, had done. He wrote it actually on a um, on a seven string uh, acoustic baritone guitar, which is a very very bizarre instrument. Or it's a seven string guitar. They they don't play. They're not proper baritones. It's just got an extra. It's got an extra. I think it's a B string. Uh, but it's a really great sounding instrument. And it's just something that. Excuse me, I've never heard anyone else write a song on before, let alone using a piece of music. And he just, he, he did something really magical with it. Definitely did. Like I said, that is, has to be just the way he sounds. And like I said, what you guys did sonically recording that, I, that's what really one of my favorites off of Untouchables. Um, of course, unfortunately, um, the album did leak a couple months, I think a couple months before it was supposed to come out. How do you react to finding out that the album had released or when that happens, how do you guys react in that situation? Uh, it's an interesting question. It's not really something that you are prepared for. And uh, we were all pretty devastated when it happened. My feeling was, well, there goes the record because, well, the thing is, is that when you have something, when, when, when something like that happens, you've got this enormous rollout prepared for the, for the, for the record. When it gets released, there's a build up to it, a single gets put out and there's a lot of just expectation created in, in, in the, in, in the music industry and consequently in the the wider audience that are preparing to to buy this record so all that was starting to happen and actually they they, they hadn't even released a song yet i don't think no they hadn't released it because it hadn't been it this was before it was mastered that the whole thing was was um was leaked and all of a sudden like that every all the plans kind of got you know the legs got knocked out from under from under them and the same thing actually happened to eminem his record got leaked as well. But what he did was he released his record immediately. Like he was like, forget the setup. We're just going to put it out now. And that's exactly what Epic wanted to do. And the band's management said, no, we're going to do the normal setup time. We're going to go through the whole thing. And that really hurt them in the long run. It was a very, very bad decision to make because they lost a lot of momentum. And one of the reasons that is, is because by the time the record was released, Everyone who wanted to hear it heard it. So you've basically lost the element of surprise and you've lost the element of anticipation. You haven't been inundated with all this promotion and marketing that normally happens when a record's coming out. You don't have that same feeling about it. And it was interesting because we were seeing message boards from people all from all over the world that were going like, you know, I've heard the new corn record and it was kind of like, yeah, but so what? I mean, it's not that great. 
And it's ama- it really shows you how much that anticipation plays into the success of a record. I mean, when it came out, it was probably the biggest selling, the biggest first week I'd ever had with a record. It sold like 465,000 records in a week. It's not bad. You know, like people can't eat, most people can't do that these days at all, unless you're like Adele or Taylor Swift or somebody, you know, but back then that was, that, that wasn't such, that, that wasn't impossible to achieve, but it was considerably less than what the expectation was. The record would have sold much more if the leak hadn't happened. I mean, in hindsight, I'm not going to say it's a bad thing because the record is what it is. And the best part, actually, is that no matter how well the record sold, it's had that effect that we discussed on people. It's made, it's cha- it's been life-changing for them. And it actually went from being a record that a lot of people on message boards were kind of like, eh, about, to people saying that it's one of the, it's one of their best records. Some people feel it's their best some people will say that it's in, it's their last gr- truly great record. Uh, and again, I couldn't be prouder of it. It's awesome to, to hear that, you know, even through all the, the mess ups and stuff like that, you still are like, you know what? I don't give a damn. This is still a great ass project that I helped create. Well, it's, tw- it's 20 years on also. People are, people are still saying how magnificent it is and how, how the kind of effect that it's had on their lives and i don't think that that's going to stop we're we're going to do an immersive m- remix of the record as well and i think that they're going that that they're going to uh they're going to include a whole bunch of rough mixes that we did for the record with this as well Let's go. so yeah yeah in fact we're kind of working on the logistics for this immersive mix right now so Hopefully, we'll be able to get rolling with it before too long. You should have told me that. Now, now I'm gonna, now I'm gonna be DMing you all the time. Hey, is it ready? Is it ready? Is it ready? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there'll be, in, there'll definitely be announcements for it when it's, when it's, uh, when it's ready and and uh, fin- when it's finished and ready. Around that time when Corn was big, there were a lot of bands, and I was wondering, I wanted to ask you this. So, I'm gonna give you a couple new metal bands that were big at the time of Corn, and I was just wondering if you would have been interested to work with any of these bands. Of course, if you weren't, and you don't, if you even if you don't know any of these bands, you can say that too. But I was curious. So, I have four new metal bands here: Slipknot, Linkin Park, Disturbed and Avenged Sevenfold. If you were given the opportunity to work or produce with any one of those groups, who would it be and why? Uh, I don't know, really. I don't, I don't really listen to that kind of music. <laughs> uh, um, it, it's not like I, it's, it's not like I approach this stuff from being a fan. Mm. Like, to me, that's I, I I don't I think that that really kind of makes my ability to work with an artist more subjective, and I don't think that I can be as beneficial to them. Like when I worked with Corn, I wasn't a fan of their music. I mean, that's not to say that I don't like it. That's not what I'm saying at all. I just wasn't a fan. It wasn't stuff that I would put on at home. <clears throat> my musical tastes generally don't figure into what what I'm working, who I'm working with. It's more about the personalities, what their goals are, and what they want to achieve. And when I look at them, what kind of feeling, what kind of vibe I get off them. Like with Corn, it was very easy. With Jonathan, it was very easy because I saw I saw real talent and real brilliance in there, and I and and I just felt very strongly that I wanted to do that. That I was very that I was that I was thrilled that they wanted me to share that journey with them. But yeah, I oftentimes it's it's better for me if I'm not a fan of an artist's music to to want to to want to work with them. Got you. Completely makes a ton of sense. Well, <clears throat> one a last group I want to talk to you about is Aerosmith. I don't hear too many people talk to you about Aerosmith. It's usually like Soundgarden or you know Red Hot Chili Peppers and stuff. But I don't usually hear too many people who mention your time with Aerosmith. And I was wondering how did you end up with such an iconic band? band and did you feel any pressure working with them because they were a huge success 
um, back in the day. Yeah, I mean, I think that the the songs that I did with them, it was more of a tryout than anything else. And uh, what that project was about was really getting them out of their deal with Geffen. They just needed to do a greatest hits record with two new songs, which I produced. That got that got them out of their deal for Geffen, so that with Geffen, so that they could go over to Sony. And I think that they were just testing the waters to see what it would be like to to work with me. It was. It wasn't the most ideal, I guess, circumstances, and the songs were. I mean, they were fun, but they weren't anything to write home about. It was great working with those guys. It was really exciting. Obviously, when you're in the presence of people like like those guys who've had this long and storied career and have done and seen things that you can only imagine, uh, it's. It, it's really quite something being in the studio with people like that and, and collaborating with them. But I I wasn't really as much of a participant in those records because those songs were pretty, they're pretty cut and dry. There wasn't a whole lot that I could add to them beyond helping, beyond setting some mics up and getting things to sound a certain way. And it, it's... It's not what we did isn't while well, while it was a fun experience it's not necessarily something that I would that I would I would write home about. Being in the studio with a guy like Steven Tyler is quite an experience. I mean it's a lot of fun and he's a real character. <laughs> That's something totally different. I mean they all are. They all are really. And the dynamic because they they at that point they'd been together for like yeah, like 30 years, 20 a long time <laughs> a very very long time so they they have the dynamic of being like an old married couple except it's an old married quint uh, quartet quintet yeah <laughs> <laughs> they just have a very very strange group dynamic you have to res- you have to be respectful of that so you can't really throw your weight around with guys like those because they really just don't give a fuck you know there's really nothing that you can do in that you you can't you can't really tell them what to do because or, or yeah you can't you can't really insinuate yourself too far into their process because at that point they'll just look at you and, and they'll be like you know you were dating cheerleaders when I was having like number one records why the you know why the fuck should I listen to you about anything you know I like you but like I mean I never I never got that but you could really tell just by looking at them they're kind of like uh uh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> like you know just be happy that you're here for the ride kid <laughs> <laughs> and i was <laughs> what uh as someone who has done so much why do you think personally in your own opinion why do you think music is such a valuable and valid piece of artistic expression well, music is, and this can be, the point can be argued, but I don't think that it could be argued particularly well. Music is probably the most profoundly effective means of communicating emotions that human beings have. It's more effective than language. Uh, you can certainly impart ideas and emotions in, through language. But you can't really transmit, you can't completely transmit an emotion to the, if, to the degree that you can through music. Movies are great and they kind of, and I think that they run a close second. Um, but I don't, but, but movies also, the mood in a, in a, in a movie is going to change drastically over the course of like an hour and a half. So you're not hit with like the same, intensity of emotion that you are over the course of a piece of music like a song that lasts three minutes you kind of in that place for the entire three minutes or so if you're listening to beethoven's ninth symphony for the most part you're in the same place with it the entire time it just like hits you in waves movies aren't like that so they can't have the same effect i mean there can be scenes in movie where you're kind of like oh god you know that's really powerful but it's never going to be the same thing throughout a painting you can look, you can stand in front of, and you'll definitely feel something from it. 
especially if it's a very good one, but it's not, it, it excites a different part of your brain. Literature, you know, it kind of goes back to, um, it goes back to words. You can paint beautiful pictures with literature, but it doesn't have the same kind of emotional effect. Music is the only thing that really does that and does it well and repeatedly. You can listen to the same piece of music over and over again. And when you do, you're going to respond the same way. Your body, you'll, you'll have the same like physical response. The same brain chemicals are going to get stimulated. You'll, if it's a song that you were listening to when something significant happened in your life, all of a sudden you're going to be transported back, not necessarily to the event, but how you were feeling when it happened. And you can't really escape that. Music is, it, it has... A special power to it it's it's literally magic and it's a shame that so much of it is so bad <laughs> stop you know <laughs> if there were less of it and it, it, so that so that more of it could be great that would be that would be wonderful uh because it's be, because it's definitely been watered down to the extent where it's not it doesn't it doesn't have that kind of power. Um, and to be perfectly honest with you, I don't think that it's going to have that power again. I don't think that people are going to write songs that have that same kind of power anymore. But there's so much of it in the world at this point that there's a lot to refer back to. And, you know, I, I do think that I do think that people in, in every generation are still going to have their, their touchstones. Uh, I'm hopeful, I should say, because I, I have noticed that with like in, in more recent generations that people are off like a song that they've gotten interest that they were interested in like two, three, six months prior really fast. And then they don't they just don't go back to it after that. So it's hard to say that it has the same effect now. Uh, but we can be hopeful, can't we? Absolutely. I completely agree. When that's interesting that you talk about that because you know I, people people will call me old head on say, you know, I wanna go back to sort of the two thousands era of music because, you know, that's just when a lot of the music hit for me personally. But it is interesting to to hear that take. So do you think that hmm it is interesting when you bring about that because I, I think about stuff like Spotify and streaming services and how readily available everything is to people. Like I have a mic right here, right here with the headphones and I have a, a, a jack here and every and an amp and stuff. So it is interesting. Do you think it's like too oversaturated or do you think it's just like too, do you think there's too many cooks in the kitchen or is it both? Uh, I, I think the availability of music was in that is inevitable I, it was bound to happen just due to how the technology has developed but as far as the ubiquity of the technology itself for recording and production everyone has it when you get a new mac computer it's got garage band on it uh so anyone can compose <laughs> compose their own music you can spend like 200 bucks and buy a so and buy software like reason and you have an entire recording studio with synthesizers drum beats everything that you could possibly hope for to make uh, either electronic music or music that's a, that has electronics and samples in it and you can also record through it to to do non-electronic music as well you pretty much have everything that you need so technology is everywhere uh, and that's not going to change. But that's part of the issue. Someone who just buys a computer sees GarageBand and goes like, oh, I'm going to become a musician now. It's like, uh, it doesn't really work like that, but sure, go ahead. <laughs> you know, give it a try. Why not? You got the software. Let's see what you got. But again, most people don't have the acuity or the talent to be musicians and that's okay because everyone shouldn't but because being a performer looks so glamorous everyone sees people see garage band they immediately go oh i can do that because that's what a world that's based around non-expertise really teaches it just says 
you can do this, become a celebrity and make a whole lot of money doing it. You know, if so-and-so can do it, why can't I? And that's, you know, it's, and it's delusional, but that's where we're at right now. And that's one of the reasons why there is such a tremendous saturation of music and all kinds of stuff in terms of content, just flooding, flooding the internet. Definitely. That makes me think about, um, sort of how people, including myself, get upset when we're like seeing like TikTok people getting into like big TV shows and movies. Like you guys, cool. A little dance on TikTok is cool, but like y'all can't act your way out of a bag. You know, it's like, it's, it's really interesting. To hear. I mean, I'm being for real. Like some of y'all's jokes don't land. Y'all cannot be comedians. Everybody wants to be a comedian. Some of y'all jokes are garbage, so I, <laughs> I don't. I mean, I know people see like Vine and TikTok, and they're like, "Oh, I could try this. I, I could do this." But that punchline is not punching. <laughs> it's not hitting. It's, it's yeah, it's sure. In the surface, <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. Yeah. With this, you know, it does go back to that, it, and and it's a it's a double edged sword because you know it is a good thing that there's really a lot of accessibility to a lot of resources that we didn't have back in the day, but also. On the flip side, we have a lot of unexperienced people and a lot of people who think they could be the next, the next James Hetfield or the next, uh, they want to be the next Kanye West. You know, they, they, they just, just, just put all this stuff out there and then you have all these people supporting it like, oh, this is great. But like when I hear it, I'm like, this is shit. <laughs> Turn this off. I don't know how people like this. Well, that's just me. That's my take on it as, as someone who's looking at it from that angle. Yeah, well, I don't think that you're. I don't think that you're far from the mark, and uh, it really goes a long way to, to to show that expertise really is important, and some kind of commitment and engagement with craft before you start diving into things and say like, "Oh, I'm going to be a music producer." You know, like, are you really? You sure about that? Because <laughs> it takes a lot of work. Right, it's a lot of work and hear sound as good as someone like you can and, and be able to hear what needs fixing or retooling, you know. It's a, there's a lot of tricks to the trade that people need to get hip to, hip to if they really want to do this. So I um, definitely agree on that. But one transition into my fun part of my interview is called Weird and Wacky. So we have one minute to answer a series of weird and random questions. No, no one has been the record of 15 questions, although... Actually, no one's being the record of 16 questions. The current championship title holder is voice actor David Boat with a record of 15 questions answered. Do you think you could beat him? I think you might get two out of me, maybe. <laughs> All right, well, I'm about to start the timer. Are you ready? In three, two, one. Favorite TV show growing up? See, you can't. <laughs> you can't do it because I got to think about that. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, favorite Probably Masterpiece Theater. Theater. Go on. Favorite thing to eat for dinner? Dinner? Yeah. Oh, shit. I don't know, man. Salad? Hamburger? Favorite restaurant? Uh, Bestie in Los Angeles. Favorite car? Oh, dude. <laughs> These are just not my kind of questions. <laughs> Favorite car? Oh. I'm just... I just uh, Aston, Aston Martin, um, whatever it was, like the James Bond one. Favorite song off of Untouchables? No. Pass. <laughs> Five! Five questions. <laughs> All right, so I did better than I thought I would. You did, you did. You did. And uh, my final question to you before we head off is I just like to say thank you so much for giving me so much of your time. This has been so much fun getting to talk to you and getting to learn more about you as a person. You know, you're my first music producer I've ever spoken to and to be able to speak to you has been such an incredible honor and just a humbling experience for me as someone who is a music fan. So thank you so much again for speaking with me. But my final question to you is, and I guess if you want to get deep, deep into this, you can. 
what is your current message to the world during these current times that we live in? Obviously, there's a lot going on in the states, of course. With the oh man, you I, you don't you really don't want to go down that road. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I like to ask this because it's just so much that it's a lot of there's a lot of. I mean, you you already cracking up. You already cracking up. You know, we have things. We have gas prices going up. We're still dealing with COVID to a certain extent. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going around. The world. If someone would actually listen, <laughs> I would say if it's at all possible for people to put aside their differences and start and start looking at what their simi- what the similarities are that the game that that we're all being forced to play is one that's completely illus- it's illusory. It's not what people think it is. See, now we're getting too philosophical here. No, no, you know, that's what this is this is what this is for. Uh-huh. No, but all the hot button issues, all the social issues like race, religion, guns, like babies, this, that, the other, it's all just, it, it's nonsense. Like all those things are, they've been engineered to create like class warfare so that the lower and the mid- and middle and working classes don't get to see how much we all have in common, how much people all have in common. Like, I mean, when when black people first came to the United States, there were free there were free people in New York, and a lot of them li- and and they lived together in white communities. In some cases, it wasn't there wasn't the kind of segregation that there was later on. You know, people create people over the centuries have created segregation between people because they didn't want they didn't want working classes to rise up and you know to look at the to look at the wealthy and go hey. You know, we we shouldn't be suffering while you guys have everything. That's what all this is. It's it, it's it's polarization. It's pulling people apart so that they won't see how much they have in common. Because we do. And as long as we play that game, things are just going to get worse and worse and worse. So the only th- that would be that would be a message of positivity for people. The hope that they would be able to that they would be able to look at each other, you know, and and cast aside what what they dislike about each other so much, and just to kind of like accept each other and see the similarities, and see how see how much all people how people need one another as well to be able to have a civilization that will last as long as it should. I completely agree and especially agree with that sentiment where it's like a lot of this stuff is just bull. It's just it's just really it's just really saddening to see all this stuff happening. Like I can't believe in my lifetime I've just seen Roe v. Wade getting taken away. I can't believe it. And it's just so weird when this shouldn't even be an issue. This should abortion should, it shouldn't be an issue, you know we're and it's just so insane to see people tear each other apart over the- yeah even you were like this is this is crazy no i mean i'm in canada i live in canada like i i i didn't i didn't i saw this i saw this coming and i was like i would rather work in this country and set up a business in this country and raise my family here um the states is like a pressure cooker right now the problem is, is that the people who set this stuff up, they don't realize what they, the kind of like the forces that they've unleashed and what this is, what this could ultimately turn into. And it's scary. It really, it, it's really, really scary. I mean, the idea that in New York, people won't need a CCR anymore to walk around with a handgun. Like, come on, in New York? Really? You really want to play with that? Like, see how many people like want to sh- just shoot each other, just because you p- because you pissed me off. Like, in the latter part of the 19th century, in New York City, everyone had guns, and people were getting shot at or and killed at a rate of one per day. You know, there'd be like a dead body in the street. You just step over them. It just it just happened. You know, if you allow guns to be readily available in urban areas where there's such a high concentration of people. And I'm not talking about specific neighborhoods, I'm just talking about everywhere. 
someone bangs into you, you had a bad day, and you happen to be slightly mentally unbalanced, and you just happen to have a little nice little ruger on you, you just turn around and put a bolt in someone's eye, you know, and that's it. These people don't realize the kind of forces that they're unleashing by, by, by doing all this stuff. They're creating a pressure cooker. And that's why I'm hopeful that people will start looking at each other and going like, wait a sec, we shouldn't be fighting over this stuff. There's bigger issues at play here. You know, that we really are a group. We're all human beings and we've gotten, and, and we're part of the same family. Definitely agree. And I'm hoping for that too, man. Cause like you said, it's getting scary out here. When I hear Texas talking about loosening the gun the gun laws even more even after they just had a, a massive school shooting and they and they're loosening it even more it's asinine to me why are you allowed i don't get the i don't get it so yeah so we do Dude, this, to the supreme court just passed the ruling where if you get stopped by a policeman <clears throat> and they don't mirandize you you can't use that against them in a civil suit. If they don't read you your rights, it doesn't make any difference. You have no recourse. I don't know how they interpreted the law to be able to to be able to make that like a viable like legal statute, but it, as far as I know, it is. And now they're going to start going after the gay community because that was what Clarence Thomas was talking about, like revisiting all these civil rights. Um, all these civil rights statutes. I'm here they want to that stop pretty much look at Loving v. Georgia, which uh, not Georgia, Loving v. Virginia, which legalized interracial marriage. Like, what are y'all doing? What, like, seriously, what are y'all doing? We have uh, a baby formula shortage in the states. There's so much going on. Ga like I said, gas prices. But now y'all want to focus on abortions and increasing gun laws, like making it easier to get a gun. Are y'all insane? Are y'all seriously insane? Yeah. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> it's a, <laughs> yeah. but it's a, but it, you know, but, but it, it's some of these people really believe in the stuff that they're doing. Like they're, they're really, they're real ideologues. Like it's part of their ideology. And some of them are whipping up the base of the, the conservative base who are m most of whom are working class. You know, and, and should be and should be jo you would think would would be joining forces with other working class people, recognize the economic reality that they live in rather than the racial or religious reality that they think they're living in, because that part of it is delusional. The economic one is very real, however, and it's the one thing that people should be joining on, but won't. It's insane, but like I said, we gotta hope for better. Don't don't fall into that pit of despair because it's easy to, you know. We just gotta keep pushing. Oh. And, and uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. Because there's lots of good things out there in the world. It's an amazing place. It is. It's it, this world is 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 a, a mashup of beauty and cruelty, and it's a beautiful thing to just see. Oh. As as life as all life is. That's the way it's supposed to be. Absolutely. Well, Michael, like I said, thank you so much. This was a phenomenal conversation. Is there anything you want to plug or promote before we head off for the day? Um, yeah, just uh, my website, uh, which is michaelbeinhorn.com. Of course, that's going to be updated soon to something else, but you'll see more about that on social media. Oh, teasing us, teasing us. And it's going to be good. Yeah, it's going to be really good. I'm super excited, and I'm so proud of you for how far you've made it and how you're continuing to make strides in your own life, and I can't wait to see what you cook up for all of us next, man. Well, you have a phenomenal rest of your day, man. Thank you so much again, and I'll be in touch. You have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. Take care. Pleasure. Have a great one, everyone. Thank you. Bye, guys.